Now in the S domain, we can still use the same circuit principles that we are familiar with from the time domain and the phaser domain analyzers. Ohm's law is typically very handy. Kirchhoff's laws are always handy. Thevenin and Norton can sometimes be applied and all the rules from serial and parallel connections apply as well as the superposition of voltage sources and current sources and also a mix of those. However, in the S domain, the math is way simpler. Once we are in the S domain and we can already start analyzing circuits in the S domain, so we don't need to do the Laplace transformation back and forth as we did in the previous example. We can start in the S domain and stay in the S domain. We simply have to do multiplication and division, which is linear math only, instead of solving differential equations which are the results of the analyzers in the time domain through the differentiation and the integration of signals. For practical applications, we often use a so-called black box approach and we define the ports of a circuit. We can define input ports, output ports. Some of the ports are input and output and very often we are good by analyzing a circuit as a two port, having one port at the input and having one port at the output. Now each of those ports has a voltage and a current connected to it. So here it's the input voltage and the input current and the output current and the output voltage. It's important that you define the direction of the signals, could be going either way, they don't need to be defined in a specific way, but once you have defined the direction as the input current going to the right side here, or the output current also going from left to right here, then you need to stick to it and you cannot change it anymore along during your calculations. Typically for sources, as it's in this case here on the input side, you would define the voltage and the current in opposite directions. And for impedances, for sinks, for loads, for example, you would define the current and the voltage going in the same direction. And that makes it e easy to balance the energy and the power going into the circuit from the sources and the power being used in the circuit in all the impedances. Now there are four specific forms of transfer functions that we can define. One is the voltage transfer function, meaning we apply a voltage at the input on one port and we see how the circuit reacts on the output. So we measure the output voltage. The other one is the current transfer function. So we apply a current source at the input and whenever we look at currents, we short circuit the respective port and look at the output current. That defines either the voltage transfer function or the current transfer function. Furthermore, we might be interested in mixing voltages and currents and look at the so-called transconductance transfer function. That means we apply a voltage at the input of a circuit and measure the current coming out of the other port or the other way around. We apply a current source at the input port and measure what voltage is generated at the output port. The subscripts Y here are indicating for an admittance, a transconductance transfer function. And here for set, we have the trans impedance transfer function and also indicating what units we would expect for that transfer function. Now note that the principles we have used so far from the Laplace transformation can be applied for calculating those transfer functions, but it is only valid for linear and time invariant circuits. A linear circuit means it's not changing with the signal, so the parameters of the impedances are constant. 
which would not be true, for example, for a diode. As the diode has a different VI characteristic dependent on what voltage or current is applied to it. And time invariant means that the circuit is simply stable over time. Again, the impedances are not changing dependent on time. For circuits including diodes and transistors, you typically still are interested in the transfer functions, but very often you need to linearize around the so-called BIOS point, operating point, and then you have a linear representation of the active elements like diodes and transistors at that operating point and all the other circuit elements, the passive components like resistors, capacitors, and inductors are linear and time invariant to start with, and we can calculate our transfer functions. Now the transfer functions from the Laplace transformation typically end up into a polynomial in the numerator and the denominator. The highest exponent of the complex frequency S is defining the order of the circuit. So for example, if the highest exponent, no matter if it's in the denominator or in the numerator is two, as indicated here, then we have a second order circuit. We can also rewrite all the polynomials as a so-called zero and pole representation. So we can extract each and every zero in the numerator and each pole in the denominator here and we end up having a DC gain in front of the transfer function. That means at the frequency infinity, all the rest of the transfer function is zero and we are left with the DC gain only. There are two very commonly used ways of visualizing transfer functions. One way is as a pole zero diagram, as you can see in the textbook in chapter 9.3, and the other way are the Bode plots that we are going to look into later in the course.